Yeah, welcome back. Welcome back to Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. Uh, here it is. Oh my goodness, it's Tuesday morning. Um, and it's Community Matters, a very important show. This time we're talking about Hapamana, which is designed to help the Keiki of Hawaii. And we have uh, Jordan Connolly of Hapamana. We have Peter Hoffenberg, who's going to help us, you know, explain the philosophical connotations of Hapamana. <laughs> but before we get to the philosophical connotations, Welcome to the show, Jordan. Welcome to the show, Peter. Thank you. Good to see you again. Good to see Jordan. Well, thank you. Thank you. So Jordan, Hapamana and Keiki. And um, you know, I looked at your website, impressive. Uh, we need that. You know, these Keiki are the future. There's a picture of, our, of your website. Uh, and that's what I'm talking about that, that sort of embodies the concept of it. And uh, what's, what's, the, uh, what's the website that we can all look at? It's hapamana.org, H-A-P-A-M-A-N-A.org. Okay. So now that we've looked at it and gotten the gestalt of it, why don't you tell us uh, what it, what, when you formed it, uh, what it does, and what you hope to achieve? Okay, so we formed in September 2016. Um, we started as a sports organization, mostly uh, basketball and uh, like uh, footwork drills and whatnot. We partner with a bunch of, we do a community outreach and we partner with a bunch of like uh, teacher groups. We partnered with Challenge Island Oahu and Rise Above, which is a tutoring group. And so they'll come to our camps and they'll do different sections with our kids, like artwork or, or like read books or different things. I, I let them kind of do their own thing while I coach. I do basketball coaching and different like workouts with the kids. And then I have other teachers come in to coach different things and teach different things also. Mm, what? What qualifies you to do this? I mean, both in terms of your desire to do it and also your, your skills and experience. So I've been, um, as a people person, uh, from uh, my first job to about 30, I was working in restaurants. I was a server bartender, so I'm real good with people. At about 30, I got my personal trainer's license and I started training uh, kids and adults. And uh, I've always played sports my entire life. So from about five years old till now, I still play sports. I played football, I even played in the uh, HGO, which is a Hawaii Gridiron League. So I played some semi-pro football out here, and I played years of beach volleyball out here. So I just bring the kids what I know. I just, I love kids. I'm good at most sports, and I know sports pretty well, so that's what I bring. But then what I'm not qualified for, for like, you know, different teaching things, I bring other people to teach them things that I don't even know about. Mm. So let's talk about the kids you want to serve and help. Yeah. Who are they exactly? All of them. Any kid. I love all kids. So right now, I got it. we work with IHS, the Institute for Human Services, and they run the homeless shelters and whatnot. So we work with all, a lot of their kids. And then we work with Punia Village Development Corporation. And so I'm actually out here right now, and we work with the kids at the development. And there's a gym on the, um, on the property here. So I got a key to the gym. I open the gym, and the kids come, and, you know, we do sports and whatnot. And upstairs, we have, like, a library where we bought a bunch of books, a bunch of toys, Legos. They have a little basketball, like one of those little games, like an arcade and whatnot. But we try to just bring as much opportunity to kids that that uh that they don't already have. But and then we also invite kids from like say Punahou or the East Side, because one of the big goals is that we want all the kids to meet each other, like be you from the wrong side of the tracks to the right side. Because if you grow up and we want to play on the same team as sports, right? So if they play on a basketball team, then they'll build those bonds that a team builds. Their parents will go to the same games, their parents will go to the same practices, and then we can just help the community to just mesh that way, you know, get to meet each other, get to talk to each other on, on good terms. Yeah, I went to a Jewish Federation uh, summer camp in New York when I was a kid, and um, that was beyond, beyond you know, historic memory. Um, and uh, what they did is they, they, they wanted to have that diversity. So they invited, on a kind of scholarship basis, people from every walk of life, everywhere. And it was before that sort of thing was happening in general. I must, I must say it was a great benefit to everyone to have the diversity, to have everybody meet everybody, just as you say, this is a really good thing. So how old are these kids? So we take uh, school age kids. Uh, so basically five years old to 18 years old. If you have a little brother that's say like four or three or sister, either one, if you have a little one that, that's with an older kid and the older kid can kind of watch them a little bit, we'll let you bring a younger kid as long as your other kid can kind of watch them. Or if your four year old is like real attentive and they already play sports and they know what to do kind of, and they're going to stay in line. We'll let them come. You know, if you're like three or two, you're probably not going to be able to, you know, pay enough attention to stay around, you know. So boys and girls together? Boys and girls together. Um, 
We're trying to start teams. We actually got some basketball jerseys donated to us. We're trying to start basketball teams, and we have a tennis team also. So the boys team, well, basketball will be boys, and then bas uh, girls team also, and the tennis you know, will be boys and girls. But when we practice, we all practice together. We all come together and whatnot. But when we start playing, we'll probably play separate, you know, boys and girls. Is it, is it competitive? Do you have leagues? Do you have you give away, um, you know, uh, uh, awards and the like? Well, not yet. We're part of the AAU, the Amateur Athletic Union, which is like a worldwide um, sports league. And so basically they have tournaments and they have uh, different leagues that you can just join through the AAU. And we didn't have any jerseys yet. We just got our jerseys right at the beginning of the pandemic. And so we haven't been able to do anything yet. So now we have the jerseys and now we're ready to do that. We can all, we're ready to do some tennis too. So basically we just got to wait for tournaments to open back up and then we'll start playing. Yeah. So what, what, what are the challenges here? I can imagine that some kids have a problem with sports, you know, the, the Woody Allen uh, dweebs, um, you know, they don't, they're not very, uh, <laughs> they're not very well coordinated. If you leave them in a group of other kids, they'll usually be marginalized. Um, that's a challenge for you. How do you handle that? So we talk about that. I tell all the kids, so, so we have Kung Fu, we have Taekwondo, we have tennis, we have football, basketball, we do ladder drills, we got like where we work out, but then we have, uh, like I said, we have the educators that do projects with them and stuff. I tell the kids that you're gonna be good at some things, you won't be good at some things, and that's fine. I tell them, you know, there's gonna be a sport that you really love, that you might be good at, and you might not like any of them, but what you're gonna do is get some exercise, you're gonna get to hang out with the kids, be friends and whatnot, and you also, you know, we get the educational part. So I tell kids, and, and one of the things we say is that we're here for everybody and that it's not, when we do our camps and we do our practices, it's not competitive to like where they, like, you know, they're not allowed to make fun of each other. They're supposed to help each other, stuff like that. And we, we feed them lunch at our camps. And I tell them not to sit next to somebody that they're going to go home with. I want them to sit next to somebody that they either don't know or don't see a lot so that they can just talk and mingle and whatnot. But <laughs> yeah, so it's all about fun. It's all about getting better. And if like you're the worst basketball player on the team, then it's fine. I don't, I'm not, I don't mind. You know, I'll tell them to let you get a couple shots off. If you make them, you make them. If you don't, you don't. It's not a big deal. Uh, one, one other question before we turn you over to Peter. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> this question is, <laughs> what, what, do you do, what do you do with a kid who is obnoxious? You know, because in every crowd, there'd be a kid who hasn't had enough, you know, structure at home, what have you. It comes from a home that's aggressive and made him aggressive. How do you handle a kid like that? Because that can be very destructive in a group of kids, though. So, one, you can kind of hear my voice. It's pretty deep and kids will listen to it. Two, I'm, I'm a pretty big dude. And, and kids, when they look at me, they're like, oh, they're like kind of in awe. And when I tell them what to do, they just kind of do it. But when I do have a, ram, a rowdy or rambunctious kid, I'll either, you know, I'll take him to the side, I'll talk to him, or we'll just put him in a drill where we're doing harder work, where they can't be, at ramp, about, you know, rambunctious or rowdy. Like, a, I have a personal trainer that comes, he makes the kids do push-ups and burpees and all this crazy stuff. And whenever, whenever a kid gets too rowdy, I point to him, I say, it's not your turn to go there, but do you want to go? And they're like, no. <laughs> so they'll just start acting like that. Plus, we have so many kids and so many kids that have been here for so long that they keep the other kids in order because they know that we're going to have fun, they know what we're supposed to do, and they want to keep doing it. Oh, that's great. So Peter, how did you how did you run into Jordan? Were you in one of his uh, teams? I ran into him because exactly what he said. He scared me, and he scared <laughs> Judah. He scared Judah. Uh, Jordan uh, years ago uh, was one of the summer school coaches and teachers at a program I put Judah into. <laughs> and Judah would do everything he could to avoid Jordan because he was so scared of Jordan. <laughs> and then finally, they became good friends. Um, and I think, in a way, it's um, and I. The folks who live here will understand this. Jay and Jordan understand this. I mean, it's just a typical Honolulu thing, right? Uh, your kid knows somebody. You start up a friendship with your kid. You um, have a very powerful, if not profound, connection, and that's basketball. Jordan, Judah, and I love basketball. And from that powerful, yet not profound connection, well, we believe in education, believe in teaching. Uh, Jordan is... Um, fully committed to what we call tikkun olam, repairing the world. And it was a kind of synergy, which happens here. I'm sure it happens elsewhere as well. But it's kind of a special Honolulu thing. If you're willing to do what uh, Jordan just said, uh, kind of get out of your bubble. Like there's the Punahou bubble, right? Which is not the DOE bubble, which is not the IHS bubble. <laughs> so you got to have somebody or some program, right? I mean, it would seem strange because physically the city's really small, right? 
but socially, you know, it's not, I mean, socially there are silos. So I became involved when uh, Jordan and I became friends, mostly through basketball. And then we started with a completely illegal project, which was trying to develop better basketball in the state of Hawaii. Uh, the eventual implication being, and your engineer now has to stop recording. <laughs> no, 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 no. That we flood UH with good basketball players from here. Um, no, but we start talking about basketball here. And basketball here led to, well, um, maybe kids are not so interested in basketball per se, but sports and fitness. And then I am the Woody Allen. So Jordan and I sat down and said, okay, you know, sports club is great, but I would like them to do art. I would like them uh, uh, to read. I would like them to have some kind of relationship with the teachers. Now, this is all in the future. And Jordan has some big plans and we got to do it slowly. But we talk, you know, we talk about once a month, text or something, you know, at some point tie it into schools, right? So the kid gets to participate if he or she keeps his grades up, right? Jordan and I had talked about, about this. So it really is a holistic, complete tie-in. And it takes, again, very Hawaii. I mean, it takes a dynamic figure. Like we talked about last week with Carl Ackerman. Well, Jordan is this week's Carl Ackerman. And Jordan is committed to it. Jordan talks to people. Uh, he listens. Uh, like with Carl last week, you know, you got to compromise, right? You can't do everything. Um, and one of the beauties of this program is that getting back to where I started, he has, um, you can't break down the walls in our community, but you can put some pretty big holes in them. So we have Punahou kids. I mean, Judah's like a typical Punahou kid, okay? So he works with Jordan. And then we got um, people in the arts who otherwise wouldn't even know where Kunia Village is. They're coming out, all right? So like we saw, talked about with Carl, it's a little program, but it's really a good, solid little program and it can be replicated. Like there's nothing Jordan is doing that can't work in Philadelphia. It, it really can't, I mean, you could export it wherever you wanted, right? The idea of people from different backgrounds with different skills getting together to give kids a chance to, um, I think importantly, learn the basic skills, like regardless of what sport you play, you need hand-eye coordination, you need footwork, you need to be able to grow into your body, regardless of what you play. And Jordan's really good about that, taking pit kids, giving them balance, giving them footwork, then you can do what you want, right? You don't have to be able to dunk, you know? So that's a model really could be applicable. Now it does, of course, cost money, right? I mean, we've got to talk about that too. So, you know, Jordan, Jordan um, and his board have to go out and they got to raise money, right? Um, some of the teachers and coaches are really good saints and donate their time. But that's not really fair to them. They should be compensated. Uh, like we talked last week, the parents got to buy in. Judas, uh, Jordan's out in Kenya Village, you know, the kid wants to go, but the parent doesn't want to get to go. You can't, you can't go down that path. You've got to bring the whole family in. So there are all these challenges like we talked about last week, but again, a uh, uh, great success. And I'm a sucker for basketball. So all, <laughs> all Jordan has to do, <laughs> you know, is talk about a draft choice for the Lakers and Judah and I are right there. <laughs> I'm, I'm a social for, I'm, I'm a sucker for social work. And I think what, what well, Jordan is doing yeah. is social work in the, in the old fashioned sense, you know, the 1930s, 40s, 30s, 40s type sense, oh, very um, much. you're yeah. offering them a, a role, you know, you're there, may I say, uh, going back to camp, you're their camp counselor. Um, they can come to you and they can get away. And it's, just, you know, it's, I, I think every kid needs a get away from, whatever his um, home fire is, whatever his family shtick is, he needs to get away and find himself. Um, and if he doesn't do that, if he, he winds up spending in his entire, you know, like uh, 20 years of his life and never getting away, he's missed something. He's got he's to play with those other kids. He's got to learn team building. He's got to learn the, the little relationships that you have on a team or big uh, and relationships with you. He's got to know that this is, makes him a better person. Forget yeah, about whether he can throw a basketball or not. Right. It's, it's that's one thing for, yeah. Jordan and I, it's kind of, it's a challenge now, right? Everybody listening knows about the pandemic. So the challenge now is for Jordan, myself, and the board members to do what we can by a Zoom. So as soon as you and I and all of us get off, Jordan and I probably have a text, try to get, say, an art instructor who normally would be at Kenia Village to do a Zoom. So we're completely in agree with, with you, but of course, one of the problems with this pandemic is kids are not 
getting out, regardless of what that means. They, they could love their parents and have everything in the house, but I agree with you, they need to get out and meet other kids. So the challenge right now, and I, and I think probably we're facing a lockdown pretty soon. Oh yeah. Oh, um, yeah. yeah. So the challenge now is to keep this going and do what we can. And really when you think about what Jordan said he, do, he does, you really could do almost all that via Zoom. You don't have the social connection. Can you play basketball by Zoom? You could teach basketball by Zoom. Judah, I, I'm trying to get Judah to, to meet with Jordan. Jordan tells Judah how to dribble. Judah dribbles, and you Zoom it. That, that, that's, you know, in the old days, that was long-distance education. You were stuck on Molokai, right? You sat in front of somebody. You lectured about the French Revolution. They had a TV camera, right? And that's how you learn. Now, it's not perfect, but it's certainly better than not learning. Yeah, and, and I think that Hapamana uh, is is going to have. Um, well, I don't want it to have the fate that our restaurants have, in the sense that you know, if a restaurant doesn't do takeout right now, it's gone. Right? I mean, regardless of what happens, you're going to forget it exists. I mean, it's one of the reasons, even though takeout's not the same volume, right? At least you remember that restaurant exists. So when the pandemic is over, you can go back to the restaurant. That's a good I feel point. the same way very strongly about Hapamana. We can't do the programs, but I don't want Hapamana to disappear so that when the pandemic is over and kids want to play basketball and learn and do art, I don't want them to forget that Jordan and Hapamana are there. So you're doing, oh, that's, that's you're doing a us a big, point. Yeah. you're doing us a really big favor by having us today. And then Jordan and I are going to think about, you know, what we can do to, you got to keep, like if you're a small business, you, you got to keep on keeping people's uh, vision. Let me throw yeah. one at you guys that just occurred to me. Just just came to me this morning. <clears throat> I was watching my, my wife's favorite uh, Japanese TV channel. Uh, all her uh, channels are Japanese. <laughs> and NHK it was. And uh, they were revealing an idea that is taking hold in Japan. <clears throat> now, you know that people in Japan travel to all corners of Japan all the time. You always see troops of kids going hither and yon taking bus tours and the like. So this company has invented a, a virtual bus tour. And at first you say, that's ridiculous. That's silly. That's ridiculous, but not. Sounds great. Not. You sit yeah. at your computer and you go on the tour and you can look out the window and the bus driver will talk to you. The tour guide driver will talk to you. Some guy next to you might talk to you. You get off the bus, you go to the shrine uh, some some tour guide person takes you around the shrine. You get as much as you would get, at least visually in, in terms of the, the sound of it, as you would if you were on the bus. And uh, remarkable. It, it sounds so so simplistic and yet really quite eloquent. Um, elegant is what I mean. Right. And, and the bathroom is probably cleaner. That's one of them. They didn't cover that in the show, but, okay. you know. Right. <laughs> No, but Jordan, yeah, I mean, Jordan, there's no reason that, uh, I mean, Jordan, we're going to talk to Heather in a little bit about art. So she used to run an art place up in Kaimuki. There's no reason she can't sit in front of a Zoom camera with paper, pencil, whatever, and do the project, right? It's not the same as walking around the table, but people will have a chance to be that creative. No, I think that's right. And uh, I'm sure some of the folks who are listening have kids or grandkids applying to college. And that's what colleges are doing. They're doing virtual tours of college during this admission yeah. time. Yeah, so you know the you one gotta, thing you gotta I, create, I you got to be creative. You know, the one thing yeah. I would I would miss, uh, Jordan, is something you referred to a minute ago. Is when 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 Johnny is a little bit off the mark, where he's um, not not playing fair, not playing <laughs> good ball. Uh, you you have the possibility of taking him aside and one to one, and sure. talking to him as, as the counselor, as the <laughs> towering all-powerful sports figure type counselor has a huge impression on him. He'll never forget this conversation. Can you, do you, will you conduct conversations like that one-on-one -on -one virtual with some of the members of Hapamana? Sure, like, um, so if we were doing like say a group or maybe a kid was acting up, I might have to wait till after the group and like do him one-on-one -on -one after, you know, talk to him after we get done with the group. And then that way, you know, it wouldn't interfere with the with the group then, you know, because you want to you want to keep it going. You don't want to stop the other kids from getting their part because one kid is doing something. I guess if online, if, if online it got too rowdy, you might have to tell the kid they got to leave this session and then go do a one-on-one -on -one with them after so we could do the talk and all that stuff. You know? 
there's so many ways to reach reach kids you know all you have to be is authentic and and have consistency uh let me, let me tell you guys about a movie that i caught last night on netflix called uh ready for this um <clears throat> what was it the life ahead now <laughs> to say that in italian it's not exactly that la, la vita la vita avanti or something like that wow. And the star of this movie is none other than Sophia Loren. You heard about the movie? You've seen the movie? I haven't seen it, but Sophia Loren, all you need to do is say Sophia Loren. Thanks. Uh, yeah, right. Okay, I'll, be well, you, I'll be leaving you guys now. Let me turn off that camera. <laughs> she's, she's well into her 80s, maybe into her 90s. Like I care? She's not a sex optimist. You an atheist? Anymore. But she plays the role of a, uh, an aging Jewish survivor. Mm -hmm. uh, in uh, I want to say it, it must be uh, uh, what's what's the city south of uh, south of uh, um, in the it's a water city in in Italy Venice and no no it's way south somewhere in Sicily you mean no in, in, not in, as far as Sicily anyway uh, it's a, Eveli? It's, Eveli? it's a big city in, okay. in, and it's got a slum and she has no money she lives in the slum in, and this, this young kid from Senegal somehow is deposited on her by a, a, a good mutual friend. And he's, he's having trouble. I mean, he's into all the wrong things. And, and the, the whole movie is a story about how she brings him back hmm. and makes a mensch out of him. It's beautiful. And What's it called? The, the Life Ahead. The Life Ahead. Okay. The Life Ahead. Is, you, you can't miss it. Sounds beautiful. Uh, yeah. It is. It is beautiful, and, and at the end of the day, there's a lot of love there. And you know, I guess the point is that you know you, you don't have to be a Jordan Conley to actually impose a, a kind of new morality, a new d discipline on young kids. All you have to be is strong and consistent, which is what she was. And more than that, she was a, a person they could relate to because she had been through things. You know, she had heavy experiences in mm -hmm. her life. <clears throat> so. Um, I, I guess this whole thing about bringing kids back, bringing kids in the right place, you know, they have a, a hard time, even here in Hawaii, uh, in, in a homeless uh, environment, and uh, they, they need you. They need you. Not, not just you, but a lot of people like you. They need us all to care about them, and you're stepping out, so that's really valuable, and we need that. And so, well, thank you. I try to do what I feel like I would have wanted as a kid, you know, like coach kids how I wanted to be coached, bring them the opportunities that, that you know, either I didn't have or the opportunities that I did want, you know, because kids don't choose their parents, right? They don't choose if they're going to be poor or rich. And so they shouldn't, they shouldn't lack opportunities just because they don't have money because no kid has money, really. Do you have a few more minutes? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, uh, Jordan, I was wondering if you could um, tell Jay, myself, and the audience about the two major groups so like what what kinds of kids and how many at ihf because they're not the same right the ihs are homeless Kunia villages is a home it has its challenges oh, yeah, i was wondering if you could just tell us um about the different groups uh ihs on one hand and then Kunia. and i some of the folks in the audience might not even know what and where Kunia village is okay um, well somebody should tell them now who wants yeah, to tell them i hope so so if you could tell us a little bit about the kids you actually work with. Yeah. Sure. And tell so, us about Kuhnia Village, what it is. Okay. So IHS is the Institute for Human Services. Like I said, they work with the homeless kids or they work with all homeless people and then, you know, they got kids. So there's a, um, there's a village right off the, right by the airport. And it's been, a, do you remember the name of it? It's been a while since I've been out there, but um, we go out there and we were doing tennis practices and then a, a, a workout practice for them tw one, uh, twice a week. So tennis was on Tuesdays and the workout was on Wednesday. And then in, in Kunia, so Kunia is when you go west, it's, um, it's right before Y and I. So it's going to be a couple exits before you would, you know, the highway turns into a street and you go to Y and I. So it's like a couple exits before that. It's by Eva. So it's Kunia, then Eva is the next exit. And so at Kunia Village, they have their own gym. So we got the key to it. And... And my Taekwondo coach was going there every Monday. I was going, I forget what day I was going, but I was going there every week to do basketball. And then once a month, we were doing the, the sports camps, the all-day camps, which would be a Saturday and Sunday. And that's when we bring in all the other coaches and all the other teachers and stuff. We bring all the kids. So at the sports camps, IHS, they have a van, a 15-passenger van. 
So they would always bus at least 14 kids out to the camp. So we would have we would have the the IHS kids come for the camps, and then we have the Cunea kids at the camp. And so Cunea has, I think, about 148 kids here total, something like that. Yeah. And I'd probably say I know about 100 of them by name. Just right. when I say them, I know other names. I talk to them or walk down the street and just, you know, we just chat and whatnot. But um, yeah, Cunea Village is really cool. It's, a, it's, it's an old Del Monte plantation. And it's actually just a bunch of dirt roads. It's not even paved. So the kids just walk down the street on the roads and stuff, and they walk up to the gym, and the gym doors open. They just walk in. But, yeah, it's a, it's a great group of kids. Most, the, most of the kids, most of the families are Pacific Islanders, no? Yeah. Uh, most right. of them are. Most of them yeah. Are. It's an interesting demographic place. I mean, again, your audience might not know because it's, it's not in the newspaper or anything. Uh, but it's run as a home uh, First of all, uh, people who might very well be homeless otherwise, quite yes. possibly homeless otherwise, or certainly in uh, a multi-generational apartment with far too many people, meaning the kids aren't gonna get attention. And it has become a, a home for primarily uh, micro Macronesian immigrants, uh, which is a group that does not really get much play here, right? And, no, they don't get socialized uh, here. And, uh, but also they, they get picked on a fair amount by other other groups yeah. and uh, the compact with the Micronesian islands uh, is about to expire. So we'll see what, what the Senate does as far as, but you, your audience probably knows we have a special relationship in good part because the US used those islands for nuclear testing. Among other right. So if you look up COFA Act, C-O-F-A Act, it'll tell you all about right, that. Exactly. Right, and so it's a particular group. I mean, the IHS kids could be everything. I mean, white, Japanese, Polynesian, black, I mean, they could be everything. And that, that is really homeless, homeless. Kunia is a particular demographic group. And I really appreciate, I mean, what, what Jordan is doing uh, is really for the long-term health of Hawaii, really important to take a group which most people just ignore yeah. and trying to assimilate and integrate them. So when, you know, a white kid from Punahou goes out there, that's the first time probably <laughs> that white kid is going to spend time with a Micronesian, other other than you know a Kahuku football player, right? A valuable Just, social experience, a valuable yeah. life experience so I would, to each I would, according to his need. I'd like to exploit this opportunity <laughs> and just ask people to take a look. Just Google Kunia, K-U-N-I-A, village, um, and and think about it. that's a kind of village could also be replicated. Is that uh, a is that a private charitable event? So like it, it Dwayne, is what, Dwayne Carisu kind of. It's uh, run by a corporation. Mm -hmm. Which is not profit. Uh, right, a five hundred one c three nonprofit. So um, again, your audience will realize that doesn't mean there can't be any money, right? <laughs> Just the goal is not to make money, but they have professional staff, right? Uh, yes. The buildings have to be kept up. Uh, there's some issues about kids going to school. So one of the things I like Jordan doing is tying it into the kids going to school. Um, very often, the parents don't have schooling um, at all, and uh, so what we're doing is you know encouraging the parents also to participate. So the kids' future can be a, a little brighter um, for them. I know we have, we're running out of time, but K-U-N-I-A, Space Village. Uh, the organizer there is Stevie Whalen. And you can tell Stevie- He's that, gonna be on the show later this week. Right, you can tell uh, Stevie you met Jordan and met me. <laughs> and um, look, no, no, nothing is perfect in this world. But they uh, they do uh, pretty close to perfect work. Well, well, Jordan, let's let's uh, touch on something that Peter was talking about before, and that is uh, you raising money for your organization for Hapamana. Um, so, where, where who who are your supporters? Uh, is it is it uh, public small contributions? Is it large um, foundational contributions? What is it? So a little bit of both. Uh, I started writing grants about three years ago, maybe, and I've got a couple actually. Um, so that's pretty cool. We get a little bit of uh, money through the community, like the people I know and talk to and stuff, and they'll donate some. And actually, I've had businesses actually start calling us, talking about, oh, they've seen our website and they, they want to donate some. Like, we actually had a business donate us some jerseys, and uh, they put their uh, logo on the jersey, our logo on the jersey, so oh. then you can <laughs> donate or whatever. So we're just trying to, and we build community partnerships, and so people just donate their time a lot, too, so I don't have to pay for people's time as much. They just donate it. And then, you know, the kids get their teachers and, and, and all that stuff. So 
basically like doing stuff like this, you know, if you if you like what we see or what we're doing and, and what, what I'm saying, go to hopamata.org. There's a donate button there. You can donate right on the website. It's at the, I think it's at the bottom of the, every page. So. Yeah. Okay. Well, we're at, we are out of time pretty much. And uh, I want to offer you this opportunity. Maybe you've already said what you wanted to say, but what else would you say to our viewers? What else, what other message would you like to leave with them uh, about Hapamana? So basically we're just a, a community outreach group. We want to get with everybody who has a like mind that they want to help people. So we've partnered with so many groups and like if, if what I say you like, call us up and we'll partner with you too and let you come do whatever you do with our kids, as long as, you know, it's kid friendly stuff, you know, and then like Peter said, it is replicable. It's, it's easy, to, not easy to do, but like it can be done again in other places. And so I'm actually from Dayton, Ohio, and I spent a lot of the time uh, this pandemic there. And I was going around talking to people, trying to set some things up. I was hoping gyms would open up, but they haven't opened up yet. So we couldn't do anything. But I got all the stuff ready for a camp out there and all that. We got a storage locker out there with uh, with all the balls, rackets, and all that stuff, art supplies, Legos, and all that. Ready to do it in Dayton because I got family there. I got people who can do it. But a huge goal of mine is to replicate it, like Peter said. And eventually, like I got a friend, I got family in Gary, Gary, Indiana, which is a very low income place. And, and my main main goal would be to get to Compton and Chicago one, at one point and be able to do this there and show that it can be done really, really anywhere. Yeah, you know, Jordan, if you want to raise some real money, um, you get Peter and me um, to do some pickup basketball uh, in public. And they'll, they'll come for miles around, won't they? A comedy <laughs> channel for sure. <laughs> so, Peter, what would, would you add? What I would, would you only, add? I would only add, and it's completely consistent with what Jordan said, is if, if you are interested in participating and we're all facing some challenging financial times, please consider donating your skills. And please consider as you go through your house, donating any old art supplies, preferably paint that's not dry, pens and, and pencils. Uh, little things really do matter. Now, if you're listening and you can write a check for 50,000, I don't think Jordan would refuse that. But if you're listening and you, for example, know how to throw a Frisbee really well, well, call Jordan. And those are very important non-monetary, uh, particularly maybe for people who are retired or part-time work. There's a lot of contributions you can make. And that would be my only, which it goes fully with what Jordan's saying. I would just, you know, if you go to the website and you really are not in a position to donate money, you, you can donate your time, your skills. Uh, I think eventually the library would like some books, some more books, so things like that. You know, it's, it's all possible, even during the pandemic. We just have to be a bit more careful. Yeah. You know, so uh, uh, Jordan and- my phone, So call the number on the website and you'll talk to me directly. Jordan, um, I know that, well, in, in Dayton, Ohio, do they ever use the word uh, uh, mitzvah? <laughs> Probably just the Jewish people. <laughs> Peter, Peter, would you explain the relationship of hapamana and mitzvah? Well, uh, a mitzvah is uh, not translated as charity. A mitzvah is an act of justice to repair the world. So it's an act where you do it not expecting anything in return, right? It's not charity, not that your soul is going to heaven. It's kind of an old Old Testament, or in this case, a uh, political left-wing desire, uh, which of course will be erased now, uh, that you just, do, you just do justice. And you do justice because, um, well, to quote my, one of my favorite directors, Spike Lee, it's just the right thing to do. You know, you don't, you don't do it because somebody's gonna say that's the right thing. Uh, you don't participate in Hapamana requiring a kid to write a thank you letter. You do it because it's the right thing to do. That's a mitzvah. And the world is built in our tradition on small mitzvahs. You know, each day you should do something that is the right thing. That's I mean, not political or partisan. It's just a sense of what we call tikkun olam, which is repairing the world. Uh, how much do we have any time left? No. It, it goes, we don't. Okay. Uh, I'll just say really quickly, it goes back to the story of Noah. And wow, that's, that's going back. Right. After destroying the world, right, uh, there was allegedly a rainbow, which all of us listening to this can appreciate in Hawaii. But if you didn't live in Hawaii, you'd appreciate rainbows much more. <laughs> and the idea was that, you know what? God's done his business. Now it's up to you guys. You know, you, want, you messed up. I repaired the world once. Now you got to repair it. And if you don't repair it, you know, kind of tough luck. And the rainbow is a sign of that. So what you're doing is a mitzvah, 
But I think it's also a mitzvah not just for the kids, it's for the participants. It's a mitzvah for the art teacher to help spread art and beauty. It's a, it's a mitzvah for uh, Judah to teach other kids how to toss a frisbee. So in a way, it's building society. And it's really necessary now with the pandemic to try to figure out how we can keep society together so when we actually get going back again, we can get going running. We don't have to learn how to walk again. I'm, I'm worried we have to learn how to walk again. Amen to I, that. Yeah, I'd like us to try to keep walking now so that when, when we get over this pandemic, which we will, right, I mean, at some point, uh, we can really hit the ground running. We don't have to relearn everything. Thank you, Peter. Peter Hoffenberg, uh, Jordan Conley. Jordan, it is a mitzvah, however you define it. What you do is a mitzvah every day. Thank you for doing that. Aloha, you guys. Aloha. Thank you very much. Aloha.